Okay. Yeah, do it. Okay. So, uh, Butterfield versus Forrester. This happened in 1809. This was a case about um, someone that put a, I think was it a stick? A pole. So the issue here was whether or not um, the person that hit the obstruction was um, liable even if, or was negligent whenever someone else did something that may not have been legal. Who, who's, the, who's the plaintiff? The plaintiff is the, uh, the one that was injured. Okay. The one that was injured was going very hard on his horse. He could have observed if he wasn't going nearly, if he wasn't going as fast. Um, he and ended drunk. the horse fast. And drunk. Don't forget the drunk. He was drunk. No, actually, not. In this one, there was no evidence of him being intoxicated. That's in the next one. Oh, okay. Yeah. My bad. So in this one, he was just going real fast. And if he wasn't going so fast, he would have been able to stop, but he did. So the argument or the issue here is is he liable? or is it the person that put the pole across the road? And the answer was um, that uh, the rule was if a man lays lodged in wood across the highway, so the person may ride to care safely by. Uh, one person being at fault will not dispose of another using ordinary care for himself. So that's kind of the rule. What's and that called? Very short case and it was the assumption of the No. no. Sorry, he got it. Mr. Ellie, what is that called? Um, last clear feet. Nope. That would be contributory negligence. Okay. Contributory negligence is a defense to negligence. Okay? Even if the defendant was negligent in setting up that pole across the road, if the plaintiff does not exercise ordinary care, in his conduct, then the defense has the right to prove it's their burden that the plaintiff was negligent and then therefore caused his or her own injuries. It is an absolute defense. There are four states, and you're living in one of them because, you know, it takes years to ship any kind of liberal thought into the state. <laughs> <laughs> Maryland and D.C. and two others still use the concept of contributory negligence. That if the plaintiff is at any remotely chance of fault, even 1%, then the plaintiff's case, he loses. Okay? Pretty harsh, is it not? Yeah. All right. Remember that and everything else that comes in that we're going to talk about. In Alabama, contributory negligence is a affirmative defense. If you do not plead it in your answer, you will waive that defense. Even if you don't know it might apply, it is automatic that you put that defense listed in the numerous defenses you, dra you draft up in your answer. Okay? If there is a claim of negligence in the complaint, the first thing you should put down is we plead the defense of contributory negligence. Does everybody understand that? Because if you waive it, you're a little screwed. Okay? Any questions? Remember the burden of proof is on the defendant after the plaintiff Finishes her chief in, uh, case in chief. Typically, contributory negligence is for the trier of fact. It is not, unless it's just 100% outright, it's not going to be a judgment as a matter of law. So does everybody remember who the trier of fact is? Jury. All right. Is contributory, defense, contributory negligence a defense to an intentional tort? Huh? Is contributory negligence a defense to an intentional tort? No. 
but y'all better yell no, because Scott will kill you if you get down the wrong. Is that on the test? I don't know. Oh, I thought you were looking at it. Huh? You, you said if we get that one wrong, it was just... Oh, Scott will just fail you. Oh, okay. I just know Scott. Believe me. We've been buddies for longer than I want to know, tell people about. In some places, and in Alabama, contributory negligence is not a defense to wanton or reckless conduct. So when you all graduate out there, remember that. Willful and wanton? Willful, wanton, and reckless, anything that's beyond mere negligence. Contributory negligence is not a defense. Mr. Golden. Where for out there, Mr. Golden? Right here. All right. Give me a Davies v. Man, please. Uh, so the donkey, the uh, the plaintiff donkey was on the uh, side of the road. Um, the uh, plaintiff kind of had him uh, hemmed up with a stake, and. Um, the defendant had a. Uh, um, uh, defendant was coming down the road and hit the donkey, and uh, hit and killed the donkey. What, what was the defendant doing? Uh, on a wagon. Driving a team. Yes. Okay. And uh, how was he driving that team? What was that? How was he driving that team? Uh, erratic and fast. Okay. It's all part of the facts that are important. I don't know if Scott's told you, the law is clear. It's the facts that screw everything up. So the, the question or the, the issue was if uh, the defendant had an opportunity to avoid the um, jack at the donkey. Um, to, so if he had, a, had an opportunity to avoid the, ap, uh, the accident, um, should he, and he didn't, should he bear the loss? Should he be responsible? And what's a, what's that doctrine called? That is the the last clear chance doctrine. There you go, last clear chance doctrine. All right, uh, one way to kind of look at this last clear chance doctrine is to say that the last person who was negligent, they're the one that's going to burden the loss. Right? The defendant was originally negligent because he tied his doc his jackass up on the wasn't really on the side of the road it was on the road but he had it so, bridled in such a way that it could not move out of the way okay and did the facts not say that the team came over the hill and had plenty of time to stop right so they had the last clear chance to prevent the accident. So therefore, again, it was their own negligence that caused the accident. Easy, right? Guys, make sure that you know the difference between contributory negligence, the definitions, because they are passed on the bar. Same thing with last clear chance. Same thing with assumption of the risk. And what we're going to talk about in a little bit, comparative negligence. They are asked, I guarantee you. The only problem is, is because they're easy, you only see two or three questions out of the, I don't know, what, 30, 40 you have to take? No, it's 300, right? Divided by five? So that's 60? Huh? Make sure you know. Uh, now, now you don't make me remember, right? <laughs> Yeah, but you should be able to knock them out. Okay, so as long as you got those down. All right, now let's get into the nitty gritty. Who just said that? Golden? Golden.
Ms. Michael. McIntyre v. Valentine. What the end? Is that what you said? Um, uh, <laughs> well, what did the court talk about? Um. <laughs> Scott, do it. I think it was this way. I don't know. You tell me. All or nothing rule. What the hell is that? <laughs> Talk to me. Quit reading the book. Talk to me. Now my mouth is moving and there's no sound coming out. What's your name? Oh, uh, come on. No, no, I just want. My name's Williams. Miss Williams? <laughs> oh, no, I know it's not Williams. That's Minnie Mouse. Oh, Karen Willis. Karen Willis. All I want to do is say thank you, Miss Willis, or Williams, whoever you claim to be, so I can ride the hell out of Scott. Oh God, don't tell him I sold you. I didn't say I was oh, going to use your name. Do you really think I'm going to remember who you are five minutes after I walk out the store? <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to ride the shit out of you. Huh? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Are you ready? I'm trying to go. First off, why is the court wanting to go away from contributory negligence? It's not really. It what? I don't know if that's a legal term of art, but. Many other states they don't. That needed. Come on, hold on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> wait. Why did they want to go away? Why did the court say the reason was to go away from contributory negligence? Outdated and unjust. unjust, unfair. You know that one percentage point of a contributory negligence could totally, you know, eliminate any monetary damages to help you recover. Yes. What types of comparative negligence did the court discuss about? Oh yeah, it's in the book. <laughs> yeah, 
What's pure? So if they contribute at all, then they would. Does that mean all of them could be held liable? No, okay. that's contributory negligence. How many people are only going to practice in Alabama or hope to? Hope to practice somewhere else. What do you think pure comparative negligence means? That means like... Scott should have warned you all. <laughs> I'm more of an ass than he is. At least I have fun at it. The damage is reduced by how much? Huh? All right. Pure, it doesn't matter how much contributory negligent you are, okay? If you're 80%, you're going to recover 20%. All right? What did the court say about that idea? Well, I found that the plaintiff may recover only if the plaintiff's negligence is less than the fee. Not in a pure system. That's fine. To a point. What are the other? They decided that they should be able to recover if they're like 90, 90, 80, 90, 95 percent Well, they didn't like the pure, right? What about these two? <coughs> Two types of the modified. Some equal to or greater. I got the errors backwards. No, I don't. Yeah, the plaintiff has to be equal to or less than 50% negligent, as the jury finds. Okay. The plaintiff, in this one, which is what Tennessee decided to do, because they didn't think it, Tennessee didn't think it was fair that the plaintiff recover anything if they're halfway at fault. Definitely more than. So the plaintiff has to be great, less than or equal to 49% contributory negligence to the accident. I have a question. Yes. Is it supposed to be less than and less than or less than and greater than? That's what that is. I mean, that's equal to. It's less than equal to. In yeah. another jurisdiction, yeah. it's less than 49%. Okay, so they're both right. Okay. Yeah. Of course they're right. I wouldn't put something, well, I would. I could. <laughs> put so something. Tennessee has adopted the less than 49% in this case. Yes, over 30 years ago. Right, as a comparison to the state's modified. Now, in this state, what did they say happened with contributory negligence defense? So, if you see a bar question where it says we're going by the modified or the pure, does contributory negligence apply? No. no. What about the last clear chance doctrine? If you see an answer with the glass clear chance doctrine, would that be a correct answer? No. no. All right. Capiche? Who say no? I'm not clear. Williams. <laughs> oh, now you're Williams. <laughs> okay. What are you not clear? Uh, uh, I can't guess. I mean, my wife has said many times I'm not a migrator. Uh, would you repeat what you're saying? What the about If you get a multiple choice question on the bar mm -hmm. or on an exam. And it's telling you that this is a modified state, modified comparative negligence state. And one of the answers lists contributory negligence as a defense. Would that be a correct answer? All right. If it lists last clear chance doctrine, would that be a correct answer? Uh, yeah, and if it says contrib, didn't I just say that? 
Am I, am I repeating myself? Okay. Yeah, I remember, it's Saturday. I don't remember what I said two seconds ago. It's convenient when all you do is fight with your wife. So, it's called male selective memory. Whenever she speaks, I turn the volume up. You got it? Joint and several. Hmm? Joint and several as well. Some, some, uh, some jurisdictions keep the joint and several liability, some do not. So I can't honestly say that would be the wrong answer. They should tell you in the fact pattern whether they would or not. Okay? Because, you know, joint and several liability, let's say we have multiple defendants, and um, y'all got this? I can erase it. Because I don't, I don't know how you would apply it to the comparative space. Well, that's the fun part. Yeah, okay. All right. 100,000 in damages. Okay? I'll try to make the math easy. We're going to say the plaintiff is 20% negligent. Defendant 1 is 60% negligent. And defendant 2. What's that, 80? 20% 20 negligent. Did I do the math right? Here's why I'm a lawyer. Okay. All right, so joint and several liability states that if they're concurrent tort feasors, I can get all the judgment, 100,000, from either defendant, what, no matter what the percentage they might be found negligent. Comparative states, a lot of them, if they haven't abolished a joint and several liability, I can only get 60% from defendant one. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or I could get 100,000 from defendant one, and then he can turn around and get what? Not 100,000, 80,000. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. I told you I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> Well, he can't collect. He can only collect eighty percent max. Yeah. And so he could get that full eighty percent from him. If we're in joint and several liability, I can get the whole eighty thousand from this guy, All right? If they, uh, in comparative, if they have the joint and several liability, he can turn around and get twenty that twenty thousand from defendant two as an offset. Okay. And Alabama, because of contributory negligence and uh, joint and several liability. He cannot. He's stuck with the full 80000 Now, if they've abolished joint and several liability, I can only get 60 from defendant one and 20 from defendant two. Question. Yes, ma'am. So if, if you were bringing a case against a defendant and, and you know that there's 80%, would you bring the 80% against both defendant one and defendant two, hoping one or the other is going to pay, or do you divide it up, or how How do you go after that when there's a division? But I'm going to find out who has the bank account. Okay. So just basically who can pay you, and that's who you And it's pay. also going to depend, now this doesn't apply here. Right, gotcha. Okay, it's going to depend on which one of these has insurance, which one of these is the corporation, who has the money? Okay, I'm not going to go, you know, go after the employee necessarily who's making ten dollars an hour, right? He ain't ever going to pay me. Scott told you about, you know, how you get paid as attorneys. You got to win, right? But what if that client came in and after discussing with them, you figure? Good God, this guy may be found 75 to 80% negligent. And you're practicing in that type of system. Is that even worth your time? Is that worth your money? It depends on how much his assets are. Let's just say $100,000. Mm -hmm. All right. For ten or $15,000 and for all the work you're going to have to do, you know it's going to go to trial. Okay, because they're going to be screaming, judge, 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 judge. 
What if you even, what if, if, like in Alabama, you're pretty damn sure he was contributory negligent? You call somebody you hate that's a lawyer, and you send them to them <laughs> and waste their time. Because you just wasted an hour investigating this, but you're not going to get back. No. Okay. <laughs> I cannot. Okay. All right. All right. I mean, the, no, I mean, the way, to me, that's contributory evidence. Okay. All right. If the plaintiff is in any way negligent in contributing to the accident that happened, it's contributory negligence and it's a zero. All right. And I hate those with the slight gross, just how like you want to say. Okay. You know? <coughs> All right, let's talk about assumption of the risk. I almost thought I knew you all's names. Who was that who just did that? <clears throat> who attempted to do that? <laughs> Mr. Massey. <laughs> I, I, I don't have my glasses on. I want you to jump up and down, hold your nose. <laughs> I want you to do the next case, please. <laughs> I will tell Scott to give you extra credit if you want to throw things at me. So what's an adhesion contract? Uh, when you don't have the ability to negotiate. Yeah, very good. You don't have any bargaining power. It's a take it or leave it contract. Kind of like buying a car. You gotta sign a contract, right? That contract includes in Alabama, this is an idiot, an arbitration clause. But you have to go to arbitration. They will not sell you that car if you try not to sign the arbitration agreement. All right? And the car dealerships have been sued, saying that that was a contract of adhesion, but the Supreme Court said, I mean, Alabama said, too bad. You can go out of state and buy one. All right? So it basically says that the adhesion contract is a take it or leave it contract. For assumption of the risk, you see it a lot like bungee jumping, riding your horse, going out and riding horses. You voluntarily assume the risk of that general activity. Next case. Man, it's going to be a fast class. How many? Do you have another class after this? No. Oh, yeah, this will be a fast class. <laughs> but since I'm 
since I won't tell on Miss Williams, we stay till six o'clock, right? Well, I don't go down rabbit holes unless I create the rabbit holes, which I usually do for my torch class. Right. Oh yeah, toilet trap. <laughs> I love this case. Uh, oh, I need to pick a name on. Meeny, meeny, money, mo. One I can pronounce. It's Colburn. Okay, so the plaintiffs were tenants of the defendant. He controlled the house where they lived and the bathroom for the use of their two houses. Um, hang on, I, we're two weeks behind, so I read it a while too. Um, they went to use the bathroom and knew the wood wasn't very good. The plaintiff fell through, and then um, they neglig neglig ugh, that they negligently maintained the floor. Uh, and they said that they negligently maintained the floor. And they sued for negligence. And the trial court found for the plaintiff. The Supreme Court affirmed and found for the plaintiff. The issue was... Um, should the plaintiff be barred from recovery if they assume some risk in undertaking an action that leads to their injury? Do you want me to keep going? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, and then the um, rule, um, the plaintiff should not be barred from recovery even if they assume some risk in um, by doing the action that leads to their injury attributed to the defendant's negligence. And that was the doctrine of contributory negligence should be used in this case, is what they said. I wouldn't agree with that either. Oh, sorry. All right. They, the, the defendant claimed what? That the woman assumed the risk of going in there, either knowing or should have known that the floor was bad. What was she supposed to do? Take a crap in her room? Huh? So did she, having to go use the outhouse, or whatever it was, did she have a choice? No. Okay. Assumption of the risk. To know the risk and assume it, take it anyways. I am aware that the risk of some kind of danger or some kind of hurt, harm can befall me, but I go and voluntarily choose to do the activity anyways. All right? In this case, there was no voluntarily, was there? No. She didn't have a choice. Plus, the landlord owned the building and owned the outhouse. It was the only place she could go to relieve herself. So therefore, that's why the court said assumption of the risk could not apply. And I don't think contributory negligence would apply either, because how was she contributory negligent? She had to pee, right? Or poop, or something. Can you be contributory negligence for having to go to the only place that you can go? No. <coughs> Mr. Davidson. No, that's Miss Davidson. Isn't it? <coughs> no, hold on, hold on. I got a question for you. All right. Let's say that my neighbor's kid is learning how to drive. All right? Mama works all the time. Daddy's not in the picture. She comes up to me and asks me, will you teach me how to drive? Okay? She's never driven before in her life. I put her in that car behind the wheel to begin teaching her how to drive. 
when she gets into a wreck. Now, guess statute, don't don't go there. Huh? She's 15. She's 16. It doesn't matter. It's my car. Can I sue her for her negligence? Why? Do what? She's not old enough to have a license, and you assume the risk. Bob what if she was 16? No, you still assume the risk. You're allowed her to drive. What if she was sitting? I said no. She doesn't know how to drive. How's she going to pack and get a license? What if she's 18? 21? doesn't matter. You allow her to drop you on the little car. Okay. That's right. I'm assuming the risk by taking on this relationship to teach this young lady how to drive. Okay? I, yo. So how does that how does that square with like people that go to sporting events? Like the NASCAR races when they, uh, what, a couple years ago, like at Daytona when the car got up into the catch fence and and or uh, you know a hockey puck coming out of the rink or something like that. Uh, on, in some instances, there is actually a contract on the back of your ticket. It says, or it says, "Go see this for all." You know, by accepting <coughs> this ticket and buying this ticket, you uh, relieve you. Well, not relieve you, but go to this website. Like Carnival Cruise Lines has it. You know, fall over dead or get sick or something like that. Yeah, we're relieved. Uh, we're looking at the Dodgers game this past season. He was struck by a baseball and died. Yeah. Now, you know, especially like, you know, let's say hockey. Okay. People know that there is a chance that the puck's going to fly off the rink, right? Or they would have the safety glass all the way to the ceiling, and then especially the people in the very back wouldn't be able to see anything. I've been to a few Fred games up there, sitting up there, and you don't really see much. Okay. Really irritating when the fighting is right there and in the rink in front of you, and all you see is blood flying. Yeah. I mean, that part's fun, but you don't get to see the punches and stuff when it makes the blood fly. Um, but a lot of times when, when you buy the tickets and everything, there's going to be something there. And, you, you know, back when baseball first started, maybe, you know, they did end up putting nets up. For safety, yes, ma'am. Am, am I not wrong in saying that? Yeah, they assume the risk is like a puck or something. But say, for instance, a player can fly through the glass. That would be a different story. If you don't assume the risk of that. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're going outside, you know the rules. Let, let's put it this way. All right, Babe Ruth signs a contract with the Yankees. All right, Babe Ruth is in, in the game of baseball is under the assumption that he may get hurt by playing baseball. What if he's running down the base and a sinkhole pops open and he falls in? Did he assume the risk that a, a sinkhole would open up on the baseline? Not reasonable. It's a bar question. Bar questions are never reasonable. That's a bar question? That was a bar question? No, it's my bar question. But it is a possibility. That's outside of the scope of the normal. Right, it's outside the, the rules. You, you guys remember the, the case with the Cincinnati Bengals, right? Okay. Let, let's take it a little further. All right. Uh, the player that was so mad then runs off the field and punches a heckler. And we have that in basketball, don't we? Yeah, the Garrett Blunt. The Oregon Duck in that time. Oh, God. Who was the basketball player for the Bulls that wore the wedding dresses all the time? Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. He, he got sued by a cameraman because he punched the living daylights out of the cameraman. In fact, the cameraman then got in trouble with the IRS because the IRS wanted half of the half million he got off uh, Dennis Rodman. Did Charles do that too? Hmm? Did Barkley do that too? Now, Barkley likes to throw people through That's plate glass point. windows. That's what it okay? Huh? All I get was cut a check. Shoot. Did that take care of your question? Yeah. I don't have the, whatever.
whatever the next case is. I don't have the name. Blackman. Blackman. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry, guys. I, I teach on Thursday nights, and I keep looking up to see my students, and you're not it, who I know by name. So, uh, let's go, Mr. Clayton. Assumption of risk. Now, the example of the firefighter in there, I don't really like. I don't think it's fair because if your child is in a building where the landlord, by his own negligence, caused a fire to start, and you go in to save that child, should you then be charged or not be able to recover because of an assumption of the risk? even though it's express assumption of the risk? Because this court didn't say express assumption of the risk <coughs> is no longer valid. It said the implied assumption of the risk is no longer valid. So remember, express is I knew the risk, I was aware of the risk, and I went in anyways. How, how is that voluntary? to go save my child. Wouldn't any normal, reasonable person go do that? Yeah, I don't really like that case. But would they be able to recover if it was a fire set due to criminal act? Well, it depends who the criminal act is. If you said the landlord set the fire to the Negligently. I said negligently. I did not say criminally. Trust me, if the landlord is, is uh, criminally said it and they find out about it, he's not going to have any damn money by the time the criminal's over. Because the high price lawyers are going to take it all. Ask Manafort, who was the general that got in trouble? Flynn. Flynn. Yeah, he had to take the deal because he couldn't afford the lawyers anymore. Maybe. He pled guilty. That does not mean you were found guilty. There's a difference. Trust me, I got clients that sit there and go, I ain't guilty. I actually had one client, I ain't guilty, but that's a hell of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't pass that up. I'm looking at him and I go, you know you have to actually say you're guilty. And you'll be lying if you, and I'm sitting there going, you're guilty, okay? He goes, oh, that's all right. If they're going to offer that. That's nothing. I won't even be down in Kilby long enough to, before they turn around and let me loose. They're all right. Did he go into jail? Hmm? He took a deal and he wasn't guilty, but he was going to have to do jail time? Well, I mean, considering the time length of the sentence and the crime, by the time he got to Kilby, they would already be processing him back out. Huh? Yeah, I think he was because we got we got jail credit. So 
Mr. Sorensen. Yes, sir. Oh, right in front of me. Hold on, I got a question for you. The defendant leads, lends plaintiff his car. She noticed that the car swerved sharply to the left while braking. Trying to stop. All right, not braking the car. All right. But proceeds anyway and is injured when she brakes for a light and swerves into him. Uh, opposing car. Contributory, assumption, as they define it, not Alabama. Say the, uh, the same reason. Yeah. She has knowledge that the car is defective. The plaintiff. The plaintiff's driving the car. Every time she touches the brake, the car tries to veer like this. But she proceeds on anyways. I would still, I would still like a song. So you think some rabbit holes I created? Well, it's not. What duty would she have? It wouldn't be negligence because she wouldn't have a She sued the owner of the car. Plaintiff defendant, y'all listen. Defendant lends plaintiff his car. When she's driving the car, when she hits the brake, she notices that the car likes to swerve to the left. She notices this and keeps driving anyways. Hold on. He's trying to answer this. I'm just clarifying for all you who don't like to listen to me. All right. She drives on, she approaches the light, she hits the brakes because she's going a little too fast for the light, and it swerves off and hits another car. Uh, you something to but, um, oh, but, 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 she, she kept on going, right? Yes, sir. She noticed it when she first started driving, she was kept on going. on her part, she kept on going. So the Nope, those are the only facts you get. If he hasn't told you, as I tell my students, the fact pattern is the fact pattern. Do not add friggin' facts. Because that's what screwed things up. Huh? She would be negligent if we can put some shade. We're talking about, we're not talking about anybody suing from the other car. That's not in the equation. It's only the driver of that car. Does assumption of the risk fit? First, she assumed the risk, and then she kept on going anyway. But when that change started to. Stop. Stop. Assumption of the risk. She knew there was a risk, and she voluntarily kept on going, right? So she assumed the risk. How about this one? All right. I own a riding stable. So okay. what's the answer? Here. Assumption of the risk. Assumption of the risk. I own a riding stable. Right? You're going to come. You're going to pay me to ride a horse. Okay? You. I bring out this horse and it's bucking like crazy. Jumping up and down, prancing around, you know, kicking stalls and everything. And I go, here's your horse. <laughs> You go, I, 
I can handle this horse. Hi. <laughs> My Nick Saban impression. Hi. And get on that horse and immediately get thrown off and smash your head into the fence. Contributory negligence or assumption of the risk? All right, very good. So how can we change the facts of what is the other one? Why? Because I don't have one written down. I mean, now, if you were just driving, let's say I went to my car, I don't tell you anything about the car, right? Here's the keys. Go run whatever errand you've got to run. So I'm assuming that it's in the car at that point. No, no, no. No. Listen. Don't interrupt. Listen. Okay? You asked me, can I borrow your car? Yeah, here's the keys. All right? Go out of my driveway and go down the road. You approach a light, and as soon as you hit that brake, it then swerves over and hits another car. Mm -hmm. Have you assumed any risk? No. Did, you, did I tell you anything no. about that car? Had it swerved on you before? Maybe. No. Maybe. Listen to my fact pattern. Quit adding stuff to it. That's what messes things. Guys, the wall's clear. <coughs> adding these facts to what's not there, that's what screws you all up. It's the only time she hit that brake. And then it swerves and hits a car. Does she assume any risk? Does she have any knowledge of the risk? Does she have any knowledge of the risk and voluntarily proceed forward? No, no, no. Ah. What about contributory negligence? So now she knows about it. No, I, no, I didn't change the fact pattern. I just asked I'm thinking about Just contributory. <laughs> Don't put facts into my facts. Would contributory negligence apply there? Yes. No. How in any way was she negligent? All she did was put her foot on the brake. Right? She was negligent because she went on and she kept driving after she knew there was a problem. No. Not the one I just said. I guess I, I'm going to need a microphone. I thought I was a loud son of a bitch, but... Right. I never told you that. All right, statute of limitations and repose. Mr. Stokes. Was she supposed to be pregnant? No. That's that's kind of the pregnant. issue there, isn't it? Yeah, it was to avoid future pregnancy. Well, no. So she had her tubes tied. The original surgery, it was not to have her to if I'm wrong, tell me. She had she needed surgery. And to help prevent further complications, he recommended what? To tie the tubes or get rid of the tubes or whatever. Okay? Now go. She gave birth prematurely and the baby was sick and had a lot of complications. She sued the doctor, but it was like three years later. That's your limitation for Tennessee is one year. Yeah. Malpractice, the court follows state uh, presidents. Rule that the statute of limitation for the plaintiff's claim and the plaintiff's appeal. Mm -hmm. The issue is 
issue is that a medical malpractice claim is the statute of limitation to get a run on the negative treatment that is performed. As we know, a malpractice claim cause of action occurs, the statute of limitation begins to run when the claim is discovered or should have discovered the injury. What's the rule of law? Sure. In a medical malpractice claim, the cause of action occurs and the statute of limitation begins to run when the patient discovers or should have discovered the injury. So when they find out, that's when. And what's that called? Discovery rule. All right, first off, folks, action. That's the lawsuit. Okay? Cause of action. That's when the damage occurred, which allows you to then file the lawsuit. Okay? Now, statute of limitations, every state has them, the federal government has their own. All right? Statute of limitations for negligence is two years in Alabama. Okay? Some intentional torts are six years. Some intentional torts that cause physical injury are actually two or four years. Contract actions, six years. Contracts under seal are ten years. Okay? From the time the harm or the breach, depending on what type of lawsuit you're filing, depends the statute. What am I saying? Yeah. I'm off the nether neverland there. Okay. Depending on the type of harm and depending on what type of action you are trying to file, you will see that some of these, if I remember right, a couple of cases in first semester, they tried to sue under a contract theory because they knew the negligence statute of limitations had already passed. Now, there is a rule, Alabama has it, called the discovery doctrine. When you find out, even if it's past statute of limitations, they will give you a set time period, and depending on what it is, it's like six months, okay, to then file the lawsuit. So even if the cause of action happened and the statute of limitations have passed, if I find out, like, especially in medical, you know, the left, the sponge that was left in, right, or the scalpel itself, okay, and I don't find out about it until after the two years for negligence, once I discover it, I have a certain amount of time to bring the action. It's very limited. The two years doesn't start over again, okay? It's typically, like I said, six months. Now, there is another thing called the statute of repose. Repose. The legal field believes that at some point in time, it is not fair to go any further out to try to sue somebody, no matter when you discovered what happened went wrong. So, let's say, for instance, that sponge, we don't find out about that sponge until eight years later. If the statute of repose says no medical malpractice or negligent actions can be brought forward four years after the incident occurred, your suit's dead. Does that make sense? Does everybody grasp that? Or am I going to get calls from Scott next week going, what the hell did you do for an hour and a half? Okay, yes, because you're all going to say we were here for two and a half hours. That's right. I'm sorry. I forgot about that bargain. He hasn't seen six o'clock yet. I got a hall pass till seven. So the faster we get out of here, I can have a beer. Yes, ma'am. The cause of action was when they left the sponge in and not 
right? so with Correct. The cause of action arises when the incident, the harm, the negligence actually occurred. Yes, ma'am. So would we differentiate based on, I mean, we're, right now we're talking about medical, but I think one of the notes talked about architects and engineers and products liability. Is there a difference there that we should acknowledge when we're thinking through? Um, I doubt, you know, well, let's put it this way. When you're out practicing, yes. Okay? The lawyers have their own statutes, all right? Doctors have their own statutes. Architects have their own statutes, okay? Which they cover under, you know, uh, you know, they have their own statute of limitations and they have their own statute of repose. And then their statute of repose is for other torts, okay? Usually it's a general variety. If it can't fit into these professional people that are covered by some statute, then it is what it is. For the bar, you just need to know what those mean, okay? They're, they will give you some kind of clue as to what applies, and then you would have to argue that. But you're not going to have to sit here and go, well, in Alabama it's two years, uh, the statute of repose is four, see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the discovery rule is six months. You have to know that after you get your card, because the day you get your card, you're deemed to have just as much knowledge as me that's been practicing for eight years. Or, you know, the senior partners at Balch and Bingham that have been practicing for 40. Life sucks, but that's the way it is. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, offhand, I, I can't I can't say yes or no. Give me a good look. I mean, I just know there are ones. I don't know if there's a statute. I mean, there could be one for contract if you think about it. You know, you contract something to get your house done, right? But at some point in time, you find out that they didn't do something properly, like the foundation or something along those lines. Five years later, or contract six, so let's say ten years later, the foundation starts cracking. You know you don't have negligence. Maybe there's a repose. I mean, I don't know. Yes. Have you ever heard of an incident where, or any case where maybe somebody was, you know, how people repress things, like something happened to them, they repress it, and then. I have no clue. Okay. So, um. Well, I mean, I will tell you, criminal, yeah. Really? Yeah. Because there are certain crimes that have no statute of limitations. Murder, rape, you know. Misdemeanors are one year, that I can tell you. But there are crimes, I mean, if you're talking criminal, but we're not in criminal. Yes, sir. Ma'am. I don't know, you don't have to ask something. Um, good question. If the defendant lawyer don't bank up the statute, if the defendant lawyer don't bring up the statute of repose when you found the cause of action, so your lawsuit will go forward? Say it again? If, say like you found the cause of action eight years later. Okay. And you say if the statute of repose, somebody brings it up, the lawyer, the defendant lawyer brings up the statute of repose, then can't do the lawsuits and go forward? No, it kill, the statute of repose is the same thing as the statute of limitations. It's okay. just saying, judge, it's dead. You know, this is the same thing as the statute of limitations. Even if, you know, they had discovered it, uh -huh. it's still too late. Okay. Okay? And if they don't bring it up, you can still, that's they call you can still bring it up. Or the judge can't say it. It could be waiting. Well. Don't bring it up because it may be waiting. Yeah. It could be because that would be subject matter jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Could the uh, court mm -hmm. hear something that never truly existed? See what I'm saying? It doesn't exist because it's the court does not have subject matter jurisdiction of the case. They cannot hear the case. Even the Supreme Court can bring that up on its own, on its appeal, and toss the case out. I'm not saying that's correct, but that's my that's what I would theorize. All right.
but you're going to put that in there anyways. If you're a good lawyer, you're going to put that in your answer. All right. That's another thing, guys. Besides screwing with your client's money, the number one thing that gets lawyers in trouble is the statute of limitations. That client comes in, you don't calendar when the statute of limitations is and getting the suit filed in time because of the statute of limitations. If you decide not to take the case, when you write that letter to the no longer a client person, you need to make sure you inform that person in bold letters when that statute of limitations expires his case. So he can't come and you know, obviously scan it, put it in your computer, keep a paper file, in, in, in your, in your, you know, I don't deal with these people because they're idiots. File, all right, or they're never going to pay me anyways. File, okay. So when they go to the bar after they try to file their own personal lawsuit and find out about this, what do you think the first thing that guy is going to say? The lawyer didn't tell me nothing about that. I went and talked to a lawyer. It's Trapper Miller down there in Bessemer. He, he, he didn't say one word. Then the lawsuit comes, right? Not now. Luckily, there's only like three attorneys in the whole state of Alabama who goes after lawyers. So, because nobody likes to sue lawyers. You hate the other lawyer. Not going to sue him. All right? Don't be that person. Send them to the three and just try to get a referral fee out of it. All right? And even if you do that, hey, I'm going to send you to somebody else. Okay? You need to notify that other attorney. Hey, you got somebody calling. Let me know if he calls you or not. So I have to send out this denial notice. Okay? The statute of limitation is going to end in three months. You need to be aware of that. Okay? Don't want y'all getting sued when you get out and start practicing. We have enough trouble with BSL students. Yes, ma'am. You forgot? Damn, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Statute of limitations can be what's called told. All right, T-O-L-L-E-D, told. <coughs> if for some reason you are trying to, you as the individual, not a lawyer, are trying to negotiate with the defendant, all right, or the best way to do this is that by through some sort of fraud, okay, the defendant leads you on and on and on like they're trying to help you but don't actually do so. Right? There was a case um, and actually helped, I don't, you may have read it. Um, you all, did Scott, have you all done punitives yet? Yeah. Did Scott give you the case of the, uh, yeah, because it's part of the Gatson, Greenwald Gatson case, where um, the old lady, you know, they had bought life insurance, her husband worked with the city. The uh, city then turned around and, per you know, stopped using that health company or insurance company and used another one, and they got a letter that said, Hey, nothing about your policy will change. Just keep on trucking. Husband dies. She's, I think it's a health policy. She, she then gets sick, and that insurance company starts denying her claims. So she goes to the mayor of Gadsden, all right, and says, Whoa, hey, look, this said nothing was going to change about my policy. Now, you're saying, I'm not covered. What's going on, Mayor? And the Mayor tells her, hey, I'd be happy to look into this. You know, let me see what we can work out. Nothing, nothing, nothing. The mayor sends her a car. Hey, I hope everything's going okay. Did you get the insurance fixed? Did you get that handled? After he told her, I'm going to handle it for you. She then goes back to him. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to handle it. Well, eventually, she has to file suit. Okay? 
So she was led along believing that some that you know that the city, the mayor, was going to handle this case, which she never did. When she filed suit, the statute of limitations had passed. <coughs> And she argued successfully that the statute of limitations was told because you were telling me you were going to fix this. And so therefore they were what's called a stopped from pleading a statute of limitations defense. Okay? So that's how you can toll the statute. All right, let's talk a little bit about immunities. What time is it? Okay, how about I just talk to you about immunities? Fair enough? Okay. There is no spousal immunity. All right, you can sue your spouse. Make sense? Trust me. I can think of multiple times I would like to sue my wife. I haven't figured out how to state a claim for shitty cooking. <laughs> yeah, she's actually a decent cook. Sometimes. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. So you can't testify. Uh, 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 uh. You're screwing things up. I'm going to ask a question. Everyone has to let it go. I thought you could. Or let me Didn't have to. But if, you could, if you're in divorce, you're testifying against each other, aren't you? You see a lot of that in criminal. Okay? The wife exception is criminal. I do not believe it applies to tort evidence. I have to go across that yet. So, and I'm not teaching evidence. Torts. Hmm? Oh, I got, I got brand new one else. They haven't even had a ride in class yet. Which is going to be really fun because I just assigned them to take home essay. I'm dead on that one. Yeah. Because I'm Max Miller. I teach towards Alabama law damages and uh, civil discovery. So yes, ma'am. How does this apply in a community property state? I have no clue because I don't practice in a community property state. When you get to property, ask Thiever. No, you won't have Thiever. Um, I don't know who teaches it on Saturdays. No spousal, spousal immunity. There is, however, parent-child immunity in certain situations. Certain situations. Okay? That the parent... Uh, parent-child immunity will, will not apply. So parent can't sue the child, child can't sue the parent, typically. That's all right, they're the ones going to hate you because it... <laughs> you know the meme, the one that sits there and asks a question that keeps the meeting going another 30 minutes? Right there. Forget it. Can a parent, I mean, the parents who are child and the child is a parent. Um, child, child abuse. Okay. Can't you see if the uh, child is an emancipated minor? Yes. Yo. Child can sue if he's emancipated because he's, at that point they're an adult. And they're on their own. So the well, that's why I just said emancipated monarchs. <laughs> 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 
I, did I not just say that? Okay. The parents don't no longer have any parental rights over them, so... It's two adults. He's covered that delay. We'll move it on. Clock sticks. Clock sticks. If the parents have to outside the scope of their parental Do what? Child abuse, child neglect. Yes, child abuse. Outside their scope of their parental Yes. Yes. If a, if a parent kills a child, in this case, he didn't kill the child, right? He put a DVD in and went down and smoked a bong for an hour. <laughs> well, technically, yeah. If you think about it. Yeah. Somebody else is going to adopt you, and you no longer have any type of legal ties. They can sue their parents for the bathroom. I mean, they have anything to sue for. Technically, because they have no rights and therefore they are not the parent, I would say maybe. Yes, the favorite more of your statement. But it depends. <laughs> But I got a guy who's going to come in Wednesday and wants to hire me so he can start paying child support. Yeah. I know he can do that by himself. And he's, he, he's like, how much are you going to charge? I'm like, man. A thousand? I'm like, dude, I don't have time for this right now. We don't try to draft a motion. You can come in and talk to me. It's free consultation. Yes, sir. Oh, no, you just. <laughs> All right, charities. Charities used to have immunity, now they don't, or it's being kicked to the curb, because charities can go buy insurance to protect them. Uh, I'm just... Alabama, okay, and this is as far as I'm going to go on this. He, Scott said you all read it and figure it out on your own after this. <coughs> um, immunities for the state. Right? State immunity arose because it used to be that you could not sue the king. So once we came over here, you could not sue the king or, well, especially you couldn't sue the king because we were no longer subject to him, but you could not sue any state or federal government. Now, the feds did away with that back around 1943 when they introduced the Federal Tort Claim Act. But they still limit what they can be sued for. The state of Alabama has not abolished that. So if you're trying to sue an agency, and the best way to think about this is, if you win, does the state of Alabama Comptroller's Office going to cut you a check? They're immune. Okay? Now, counties and cities are not immune. But there are procedures that you have to jump through. And the only thing you can sue them for is negligence. You cannot sue them for wanton conduct. Don't they have caps too? They do have caps. It's typically $1,000 for one person. If it's more than one person, it's up to 300000 period. Doesn't matter if four of you got hurt. 300,000, and that is it. <laughs> Do what? You can always ask me after class. Okay. Uh, where is it? How many of my notes? Now, anyways, I can't find it. There are certain procedures you have to give notice to the municipality. Um, I believe they have, I believe they have 90 days to decide whether or not they're going to do anything about it. After that, you can sue them. If they're going to take care of it, and you know, and, and 
handle it without going through a lawsuit. And then um, counties, they have six months. And there has to be some decision. Even if they do not decide anything, the, committee, the county committee meeting notes, if they state such, you know, no, we're not going to handle this. After six months, that's good enough for you to sue them. Okay? And remember, you can only sue them for negligence. Although there is a case out there that you can sue the Birmingham Airport, not for negligence, but for wantonness. Go figure. All right, that's all I got. You're supposed to read stuff about ministerial or discretionary functions and immunities that go with the employees of the government.